Lift up your heart and praise. Lift up your hands and praise. Lift up your voice and praise. And Moshe said, Hear, O Yisrael, Yahweh your Elohim, Yahweh is one, and you shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your might. And these words which I am commanding you today shall be in your heart. And you shall impress them upon your children. And you shall speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way. When you lie down and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. And they shall be as frontless between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom to everyone worshiping with us at home. It's a privilege to be here today. Amen. Uh, we're going to have a second part in the message that uh, gave uh, last time when we discussed Gentile Ben. And today, uh, we are going to uh, have this message called, Where Have Your Children Been? All right? Now, uh, in our first part of the study, we discussed Gentiles who are turning to Elohim and the requirement or the lack thereof of circumcision. See, there's been this long held belief uh, concerning the Gentiles that they never have to be circumcised to enter into the full blessings of Yahweh. The proponents of this idea believe that there are different standards for the, for the Gentile versus the Jew. And this idea is advanced primarily because of the writings of Paul and the requirements in Acts 15 uh, put on the Gentiles who were turning to Elohim by the apostles. Um, this was a result of a dispute between uh, Pharisee believers in Yahshua, a group which was known as the circumcision, and the taught ones of Yahshua over the matter. The Pharisees said that the Gentiles had to be circumcised right away, but the taught ones suggested, at the, at the suggestion of Yaakov, that would be James, uh, uh, and they all agreed to this. Look with me in Acts 15 so we can kind of get, get caught up to where we were. Acts 15. We're going to start reading in verse 19 and we're going to be on page 1068. Acts 15, 19. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to Elohim, but that we write to them to abstain from the defilements of idols and from whoring and from what is strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moshe has in every city those proclaiming him being read in the congregation every Sabbath. Now, this does not say for them to never get circumcised, does it? It says to abstain from certain defilements. Go and learn the words of Moshe from those proclaiming him every Sabbath. Right? But we also looked at several things that the Gentiles who were turning to Elohim would hear when they went into the synagogue. In many places where it says that you too must be circumcised in order to enter into the blessings of Yahweh, if one was to join themselves to Yisrael. All right? But we also learned that this idea of the apostles was no different than the way in which Yahweh dealt with Abraham. Because Abraham too was, guess what? An uncircumcised Gentile who was turning to Elohim. He was a man raised in a house of idolatry in a foreign land. He was... 75 years old when Yahweh called him out, and 99 when he was finally circumcised. All right? Yet he was circumcised. All right? So we see this same idea that the apostles chose going all the way back to the book of Genesis, bare sheet. So it's not a new idea. It's not a new way of dealing with Gentiles, and yet... As I said, Abraham was circumcised. Right. But there are those that teach this dangerous doctrine. This dangerous doctrine that Yahweh has different measures and weights for the Israelite versus the Gentile. 
And no matter how many times the Word says there is one law, and even Paul says that there's neither Greek nor Jew, for all are one, what? In Messiah, all right? They still maintain that there are different measures and weights, which Yahweh says we're not to have, okay? All right. So why is this a dangerous teaching? Okay, well, there's, there's three places to look. We looked at them last week. Uh, Matthew 5, 18. We're going to look at these three real quickly. Matthew 5, 18. And, and we're on page 921 in the 98 ISR. And Yahshua says, For truly I say to you, till the heaven and the earth pass away, one jot or one tittle shall by no means pass from the Torah till all be done. Whoever then breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches men so shall be called least in the reign of the heavens. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the reign of the heavens. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall by no means enter into the reign of the heavens. Now, I know there's a couple of things there. One, Yahshua said this is going to be around for a while. Okay, but I know people that will say, well, that just applies to the Jews. Well, that's, that's the third reason, but we'll get to the second one next. Matthew 7, 22. But that was one reason why it's a dangerous teaching. Matthew 7, 22. Many shall say to me in that day, Master, Master, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many mighty works in your name? And then I shall declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work lawlessness. Okay, so if everything's supposed to be the same, but you're breaking uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, practicing lawlessness and Yahshua says, depart from me, that would be a dangerous thing. Oh, man, that would be a dangerous thing. All right. And the other reason is this, Matthew 28 and 19. When Yahshua gives the, the taught ones, the apostles, uh, what's known as the Great Commission by many, uh, verse 19, he says, Therefore go and make taught ones of all the nations. Now that would be the Goyim, that would be the Gentiles. All right? But look what he says about making taught ones of them. Immersing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the set-apart Spirit, teaching them to guard all that I have commanded you, who would have been Israelites living in Judea. All right? And see, I am with you always until the end of the age. So it's kind of hard to say that this is just a Jew, Jewish thing when Yahshua said, go teach it to the nations. Everything that I taught you. All right. See, it's really hard to have it both ways. That is to maintain that the Torah, according to the teachings of Yahshua, is in effect. Because there are groups that will sit there and they'll, they'll, they'll say, we go by Matthew 5, 17 through 19. But to say all that Yahshua taught is still in effect and that he will not even recognize those that practice lawlessness at the judgment and then go and teach the Gentiles to keep all that, I, that, he, that he taught his taught ones while simultaneously maintaining that there is a different standard for Gentiles who are turning to Elohim. It's kind of hard to have it both ways. All right? And that they're not bound to keep the Torah like others are. All right? All this is reducing to irrelevance the apostles who were in Jerusalem and Paul because they are the ones that they say are promoting this idea. All right? We're not going to do a full breakdown today on the letter uh, to the assembly in Rome. But we are going to look a good bit at it, and we'll look some more next, next time, most likely. But we need to look at some of the details that are in Romans and Galatians. Uh, these are probably the two most quoted as well as misunderstood letters for advancing these ideas that the Torah is not binding for believers. And we'll also look at some of the other things that Yahshua said. And I remind you again from our, our last part of this study that Abraham was an uncircumcised Gentile who turned to Elohim. I think it's an important point, you know it? All right. 
an uncircumcised Gentile who turned to Elohim, who became circumcised with all his household. And that only circumcised Israelite or Gentile with them made of the Passover forever, that Yahweh is an Elohim to all people, and that the Gentile is uh, turning to Elohim is also discussed in Isaiah 56. So let's turn there for one time. Isaiah 56, Yeshua 56, verse 457. And then we'll be moving past our little recap of last uh, last part of the sermon. All right? Isaiah 56, 6 says, Also the son of the foreigner who joined themselves to Yahweh to serve him and to love the name of Yahweh to be his servants, all who guard the Sabbath and not profane it and hold fast to my covenant. Them I shall bring to my set-apart mountain and let them rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their slaughterings are accepted on my altar for my house is called a house of prayer for all the peoples. So this, is, this issue is not something that merely comes up for the first time in the book of Acts. Amen? All right. But it's actually been dealt with in the same way for quite a long time. And the reason I bring these things up, especially the way in which Yahweh related to Abraham and the way that Abraham related to Yahweh, seems to keep coming up again and again in our letters and the words of Yahshua. By the way, I've got a question. Do you know which letter was written first, Romans or Galatians? Galatians was written first. It was supposedly written uh, in the year 57, and Romans was written in the year 58. Okay? And, and see, Paul was clearly a Torah observant man. All right? And Romans may offer us a little extra clarity as we examine it. But Paul's writings are often used as one-liners to do away with the Torah and that makes him a false witness if he's breaking or teaching to break even the least. Amen? All right, now, once again, that relegates him to irrelevance when people do that. It makes him least in the kingdom just saying. All right, now what, you, what I want you to do first here is we're going to turn to Galatians chapter 3. All right. Galatians chapter 3. going to be on page 1129. And before we read anything there, though, is everybody there? I want you to turn to Romans. Keep your finger here. Romans chapter 2. All right. Is everybody there? Because we're going to do something. All right. Galatians 3 verse 11. Don't lose your place in Romans now. 3 verse 11. And that no one is declared right by Torah before Elohim is clear, for the righteous shall live by belief. All right? Now keep your finger there. Turn to Romans 2.13. For not the hearers of the Torah are righteous in the sight of Elohim, but the doers of the law shall be declared right. Now flip back to Galatians 3.11. All right? Well, you're supposed to keep your finger there. <laughs> And that no one is declared right by Torah before Elohim is clear, for the righteous shall live by belief. Keep your finger there and turn back. Romans 2.13 For not the hearers of the Torah are righteous in the sight of Elohim, but the doers of the law shall be declared right. No matter how many times you flip this back and forth like that, it's going to look like a contradiction. Amen? Context is king. So what's going on? He, he actually says the same thing in Romans chapter 3. I just wanted you to flip back between both books. 
let, let's see if we can get to the bottom of some of this, all right? Um, but I will tell you that Paul teaches that belief comes first, but keeping Torah follows and is expected, all right? Why else would he continue to bring up actions and behaviors which will keep you out of the kingdom of heaven, which he does frequently? All right? And I also remind you that the thrust of much of what follows has to do with the Jews and a movement called the circumcision, which was compelling new non-Jewish converts to be circumcised right away in order to be saved as they believed, you see. Because one of the things that happens frequently is in, a, in this culture over here, we, we kind of take what Paul's saying and try, and, and try to apply it to what we know. When that's not necessarily what Paul was addressing when he was addressing some of these things, okay? So that is why we as well as Paul and others are drawing attention to Abraham and his experience as a convert. So, keep in mind, when circumcision keeps coming up, that very thing there. And this, it's not about that you don't have to ever be circumcised. It's about turning to Elohim and learning what He wants first. Okay? So let's turn to Romans chapter 1. Well, I think we're going to read that whole chapter. I think. Romans chapter 1. You ought to be pretty close. <laughs> All right. Verse 16, Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the good news of Messiah, for it is the power of Elohim for deliverance to everyone who believes, to the Yehudit first and also to the Greek. All right, so right off, Paul's indicating here that there is a sameness in the Jew and the Gentile. Right? All right? Verse 17. For in it the righteousness of Elohim is revealed from belief to belief as it has been written, but the righteous shall live by belief. Now the ISR has a footnote here that says that comes from Habakkuk 2.4 and, and, uh, and where it says that in the ISR it translates the word steadfastness instead of belief. But it's the Hebrew, it's Hebrew word. It's, it's uh, H. 5.30 and it's emunah and it means literally firmness according to Strong's, figuratively security and moral fidelity. That's what that word belief means as quoted from here. All right. And perhaps we ought to think about it that way when we're considering the New Testament writings. That, that it means something more like that instead of I consider this thing to be true. Alright. Verse 18. For the wrath of Elohim is revealed from heaven against all wickedness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. All right, right away, this should clue you in that belief has to do with something more than accepting something to be true because he says the wrath of Elohim is revealed from heaven against all wickedness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known of Elohim is manifest among them, for Elohim is manifested to them. Now, watch what it says about behavior, remembering what he just said, that, that he said that it's the power of Elohim for deliverance to everyone who believes. Verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible qualities have been seen, clearly seen, being understood from what... Uh, uh, has been made both his everlasting power and mightiness for them to be without excuse because although they what are those next two words knew Elohim for although they knew Elohim they did not esteem him as Elohim nor gave thanks but became vain in their their what reasonings and their undiscerning heart was darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and changed the esteem of the incorruptible Elohim into the likeness of an image of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed beasts and of reptiles. Therefore Elohim gave them up to uncleanliness and the lust of their hearts to disrespect their bodies among themselves who changed the truth of Elohim into the 
falsehood and worshiped and served what was created rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Because of this, Elohim gave them over to degrading passions. For even their women exchanged natural relations for what is against nature. We're seeing behaviors here, right? And likewise, the men also, having left natural relations with women, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing indecency and receiving back the reward which was due for their strength. And even as they did not think it worthwhile to possess the knowledge of Elohim, Elohim gave them over to a worthless mind to do what is improper. Having been filled with all unrighteousness, whoring, wickedness, greed, evil, filled with envy, murder, fighting, deceit, evil habits, whisperers, slanderers, haters of Elohim, insolent, proud boasters, divisors of evils, disobedient to parents, without discernment, covenant breakers, unloving, unforgiving, ruthless. It's a lot of behavior here, right? Who, though they know the righteousness of Elohim, I would say that might be belief sort of like what we do today in a lot of cases, you know? All right? Who, though they know the righteousness of Elohim, that those who practice such deserve death not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Mm -mm -mm. Does any of that sound familiar? Huh. But he said in verse 21 that they knew Elohim. Evidently, Paul does not consider that to be enough. 2 verse 1. Therefore, O man, you are without excuse. Everyone who judges, for in which you judge another... You condemn yourself since you who judge practice the same wrongs. All right, so evidently beliefs, belief means that it should manifest into something more than an opinion or having good feelings about it. All right? I've got this relationship. <clears throat> Verse 2. And we know that the judgment of Elohim is according to truth against those... What are those next two words? who practice such wrongs. And do you think, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such wrongs and doing the same, that you shall escape the judgment of Elohim? I remind you who he's talking to here. He's not talking to a congregation in the United States that, was, that came up in the 20th and the 21st century. He's talking to people who are influenced by a uh, a system of Judaism. That's what he's talking to here. That's why he's, well, as we go along, you'll see. Verse uh, 4. Or do you despise the richness of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of Elohim leads you to what? Repentance. What's that got to do with belief? Evidently something very important. <laughs> Verse 5. But according to your hardness and your unrepentant heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation uh, uh, of the righteous judgment of Elohim. Because repentance would mean turning away from things like those evil practices just mentioned. Amen? All right, that's what repentance means. Verse 6. Who shall render to each one according to his worth works everlasting life to those who by persistence in good works seek for esteem and respect and incorruptibility but wrath and displeasure to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness. Affliction and distress on every human being working what is evil of the Yehudit first and also of the Greek. You see that? working what is evil of the Yehudit verse and also of the Greek. But esteem, respect, and peace to everyone working what is good to the Yehudit verse and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with Elohim. That would be equal measures and weights, amen? 
Seems like it to me. All right. For as many as sinned without Torah shall also perish without Torah, and as many as sinned in the Torah shall be judged by the Torah. For not the hearers of the Torah are righteous in the sight of Elohim, but the doers of the law shall be declared right. For when Gentiles, who do not have the Torah by nature, do what is in the Torah, although not having the Torah, they are a Torah to themselves, who show the work of the Torah written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and, uh, and between themselves, their thoughts, accusing or even excusing, in the day when Elohim shall judge the secrets of men through Yahshua Messiah, according to my good news. See, you are called a Yehudi, a Jew, and rest on the Torah and make your boast in Elohim. You know the desire of Elohim and approve what is, what's that next word? Superior, being instructed out of the Torah and are trusting that you yourselves are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of foolish ones, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and of the truth in the Torah. The truth in the Torah. You then who teach another, do you teach yourself? You who proclaim what a man that a man should not steal, do you steal? Is Paul saying you shouldn't steal? He's also saying you shouldn't just not steal. You shouldn't teach somebody else that it's wrong and turn around and do it. You who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? It's, it's is he saying that adultery is okay? No, he's saying you, it's not okay and you don't teach somebody else to do it and then you do it yourself because you're going to receive greater wrath. Belief means a little more than having just an opinion, I mean. All right, moving right along. You who abominate idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the Torah, through the transgression of the Torah, do you disrespect Elohim? For the name of Elohim is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it has been written. Look at this. For circumcision indeed profits if you keep the Torah. But if you are a transgressor of the Torah, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So, if an uncircumcised one watches over the righteousness of the Torah, shall not his uncircumcision be reckoned as circumcision, and the uncircumcised by nature who perfects the Torah shall judge you who notwithstanding letter and circumcision are a transgressor of the Torah. For he is not a Yehudit who is so outwardly, neither is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but a Yehudit is he who is so inwardly in circumcision is that of the heart in spirit. Not literally, whose praise is not from men, but from Elohim. Okay, now, delve into that a little more in a minute. Look at what it says next. What then is the advantage of the Yehudit? Or what is the value of the circumcision? Much in every way. Do you see that he wrote that? Much in every way. Because firstly, indeed, they were entrusted with the words of Elohim. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief nullify the trustworthiness of Elohim? Let it not be. But let Elohim be true and every man a liar, as it has been written, that you should be declared right in your words and prevailing in your judging. But if your unrighteousness establishes the righteousness of Elohim, what shall we say? Is Elohim unrighteous, who is, a, who is inflicting wrath? I speak as a man. Let it not be. Otherwise, how shall Elohim judge the world? For if the truth of Elohim has increased through my lie to his esteem, why am I also still judged as a sinner? And why not say, let us do evil so that good might come? As we are wrongly accused, and as some claim that we say, their judgment is in the right. What then? Are we better than they? 
Not at all. For we have previously accused both Yehudim and Greeks, and they are all under sin. As it has been written, there's no one righteous, no, not one. There is no one who is understanding. There is no one who is seeking Elohim. They all have turned aside. They have uh, together become worthless. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb, and their tongues they have deceived. The poison of adders is under their lips, whose mouth is filled with the cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and wretchedness is in their ways, and they uh, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of Elohim before their eyes, and we know that whatever the Torah says, it says to those who are in the Torah, so that every mouth might be stopped, and all the world come under judgment before Elohim. Therefore, by the works of Torah, no flesh shall be declared right before him, for by the Torah is the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the Torah, a righteousness of Elohim has been revealed, being witnessed by the Torah and the prophets, and the righteousness of Elohim is through belief in Yahshua Messiah to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the esteem of Elohim. That's why he's talking about right there, that, that no one's declared right by works of the Torah because no, everyone has sinned and fallen short. That's, that's what his point is in, in that. All right? he's, not saying, he's not saying that we're not supposed to keep the Torah. He says it's superior. Twenty-three. For all have sinned and fall short of the esteem of Elohim, being declared right without paying by his favor through the redemption which is in Messiah Yeshua, whom Elohim set forth as an atonement th through belief in his blood and demonstrate to demonstrate his righteousness because in his tolerance Elohim had passed over the sins that had taken place before to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he is righteous and declares righteous the one who has belief in Yahshua. Where then is the boasting? It is shut out. By what Torah? Of works? No, but by Torah of belief. For we reckon that a man is declared right by belief without works of the Torah. Wait, that's starting to sound crazy. Not really. Like Pat says, context is king. Or is he the Elo Elohim of the Yehudim only and not also of the Gentiles? Yea, of the Gentiles also. Since it is one Elohim who shall declare right the circumcised by belief and the uncircumcised through belief. Do we then nullify the Torah through the belief? Let it not be. On the contrary, we establish the Torah. Now, that does not mean, as some like to think, that, that what this means is whatever I decide to do, however I decide to live my life, that I establish the Torah. You know, you know what's, what's right for me is right for me, and what's right for that's not what this means. I didn't finish that. And what's right for you is right for you. That's, that's not what this means. It means we do the Torah. That's what it means when he says we establish the Torah. All right, now, we're going to be moving right, uh, right on through Romans, so keep your finger there. But, but look here at Genesis 15. Bear sheet 15. Because you see, Paul's about to really get on the Abraham thing a minute. Because we remember, well, we'll see. There's sheet 15, verse 5, page 13. And y'all was talking to Abraham here, to Abraham. And he brought him outside and said, Look, verse 5, look now toward the heavens and count the stars if you're able to count them. And he said to him, So are your seed. And he believed in Yahweh and he reckoned it to him for righteousness. Okay? Yahweh said something and Abraham believed him. Remember, 
Abraham, Abraham sort of at a disadvantage in a lot of ways here because of his upbringing. All right? He's been, he's been raised in corruption and idolatry his whole life. So his dad put food on the table, best I can tell. You know? He was raised this way in spite of that. Yahweh comes and tells him something remarkable and he believes Elohim. You know? Genesis 17, verse 1. And it came to be when Abram was 99 years old that Yahweh appeared to Abram and said to him, I am El Shaddai. What's that, what's that next line? Walk before me and be perfect. And I give my covenant between me and you and shall greatly increase you. And Abram fell on his face and Elohim spoke with him saying, as for me, look, my covenant is with you, and you shall become a father of many goyim. Just saying. Doesn't say Jews. It says many goyim. Nations. And no longer is your name called Abraham, but your name shall be Abraham. And here's why. Because I shall make you a father of many goyim. Now, we'll delve further into this in the next lesson, hopefully. All right. And he spoke this to Isaac about his father and the covenant that Yahweh made with him. And why? Genesis 26. Don't lose your place in Romans. Twenty six and verse four. And Yahweh speaks to Yitzhak, to Isaac, and says, And I shall increase your seed like the stars of the heavens, and I shall give all these lands to your seed, and in your seed all the Goyim of the earth shall be blessed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham Believed, but that's not what it says, believed. But because he believed, it manifested into something. All right? Because Abraham obeyed my voice and guarded my charge, my commands, my laws, and my Torah. Torah is the plural of instructions. The plural of Torah. It's, it's in, not instructions, it's instructions or teachings. Okay? So Abraham's belief manifested itself into something else that, that caused Yahweh to establish the covenant beyond. All right? Now, back to Romans chapter 4, page 1089. What then shall we say? Abraham, remember we were just talking about Abraham? <laughs> Abraham our father to have found according to the flesh. For if Abraham was declared right by works, he has ground for boasting, but not before Elohim. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed Elohim, and it was reckoned to him for righteousness. And to him who is working the reward, it is not reckoned as favor, but as debt. And to him who is not working, but believes on him who is declaring Right, the wicked, his belief is reckoned for righteousness, even as Dawid also says of the blessedness of the man to whom Elohim reckons righteousness without works. Blessed are those whose lawlessnesses are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom Yahweh shall by no means reckon sin. Is this blessing then upon the circumcised only? For also upon the uncircumcised. For we affirm belief was reckoned unto Abraham for righteousness. How then was it reckoned? Being in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Now watch this line. And he, re and he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of righteousness of belief while in uncircumcision. That should not be overlooked. That is a strong 
wine to consider right there. Okay? And he received the sign of circumcision. He had belief. He received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness while in circumcision. Abraham the Gentile, who had turned to Elohim, received the sign of circumcision, the seal of righteousness of the belief, for him to be a father of all those believing through uncircumcision, for righteousness to be reckoned to them also. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the belief which our father Abraham had in uncircumcision. Right. Now, I can assure you that if Abraham, after his circumcision, had started to do the kind of things that Paul mentioned as a transgressor earlier in this letter, that Abraham's circumcision would have been reckoned as uncircumcision. He'd be no different. He'd be no different than the circumcised that, that Paul is, is uh, chastising or addressing. All right. And his seal of righteousness would have become a sign of mockery. Which is what it became in many cases. Okay? That's why Paul says that the circumcision indeed profits if you keep the Torah. All my laws, all my charges, all my Torah. All right? But if you do not, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. All right? Now, turn with me to Matthew chapter 3, because I want to remember something that John the Baptist said, because we're going to take a little detour in a second. Matthew 3, I'm going to be uh, reading in verse 7, page 919. <clears throat> Matthew 3, verse 7, John the Immerser, Yochanan. And seeing many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his immersion, he said to them, Brood of adders, who has warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Bear, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance. And do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as father. For I say to you that Elohim is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. He is in essence saying the same thing without repentance and devotion to Elohim. Your circumcision is worthless. He did not say don't be circumcised. All right? But watch this. John chapter 8. We're going to start reading verse 28, page 1029. I think we may see that Paul, Paul wasn't the first one to come up with this idea, after all. So Yahshua said to them, verse 28, When you lift up the son of Adam... Then you shall know that I am he, and that I do none at all of myself, but as my Father taught me these words I speak. And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. As he was speaking these words, many believed in him. So Yahshua said to those Yehudim who believed in him, If you stay in my word, you are truly my taught ones. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Then it says, they, now these are not his believers. This is back to the, the Pharisees that were there, stirring trouble up. They answered him, we are the seed of Abraham, and have been servants to no one at any time. How do you say you shall become free? Now, this was said by fellows who were currently under Roman rule. All right, we've been servants to no one. Right. And they also seemed to have forgotten that they had, they had been carried away once upon and ruled over by the kings of Babylon. All right, so I don't know what they're thinking. I don't know what they're thinking there. Yahshua answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone doing sin is a servant of sin. I want you to remember that. Right? Yahshua said that. Everyone doing sin is a servant of sin. It's going to be relevant. 
That, because what that means is that sin rules over you and you are its servant. Is that hard to understand? No, that's, that's who you're serving. All right? And that's what Paul's talking about in Romans 6. We'll get to that. But Paul, Paul is saying the same thing as Yahshua. I'll check something here. Yeah. Um, okay. Verse 35. And the servant does not stay in the house forever. A son stays forever. If then the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are seed of Abraham. You see, he said that. He said, I know that you're seed of Abraham. Yahshua says that he knows that they are the seed, but a little further down, he says that they're not. And he tells you why. All right. Verse 37. I know that you are the seed of Abraham, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Yahshua said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the, what's that next word? Works of Abraham. Do you realize that he is in essence here saying that your circumcision has become uncircumcision? That's what he's saying. If, if you were Abraham's seed, you'd be doing like Abraham. Your circumcision has become uncircumcision. All right. Verse 40, But you seek to kill me. A man who has spoken to you the truth which I heard from Elohim. Abraham did not do this. You do the works of your father. Then they said to him, We were not born of whoring. We have one father, Elohim. Yahshua said to them, If Elohim were your father, you would love me. For I came forth from Elohim, and I am here. And am here. For I have not come of myself, but he who sent me. Why do you not know what I say? Because you're unable to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. Well, I bet that made him mad. <laughs> you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you wish to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and has not stood in truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks the lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and a father and the father of it. You're not following the, the, the teachings and work of Abraham as your father. You're following the teachings and the works of the devil. So you have made him your father. That's what he's saying. All right? Verse 45. Because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Who of you proves me wrong concerning sin? And if I speak the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of Elohim hears the words of Elohim. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of Elohim. You see, sometimes Father refers to someone uh, whom, whom, whom you have been discipled by. Okay? Uh, and I, a little more on that next time we get together. But the point is, though, is we are made right through belief. Even though we are made right through belief, we may not necessarily know everything that Yahweh expects of us yet. Okay? Once we know what He wants, we're expected to love Him and keep His commands. Alright? And, and see, that would be just like Abraham. That would be just like Abraham. Right? Now, Paul is dealing with an attitude in this letter. He's not instructing people to not be circumcised. Right? He's trying to change perception and not the Torah and not the Torah. So when we get together next time, we're going to talk uh, about how this relates to John chapter 6. I'm sorry, with, with Romans chapter 6 and uh, uh, some, some other relevant things before we conclude with this little study here. But I want you to know that Paul is trying to change the perception, not the Torah, because Yahweh knows where his children have been. Yevrekeka Yahweh by Ishmareka Yair Yahweh Panavaleka Bikaneka Yasa Yahweh Panavaleka Biasim Lakash Shalom. Yahweh bless you and guard you. Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and show favor to you. Yahweh lift up his face upon you and give you his complete contentment.